بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As to what follows my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our gathering and to bestow his mercy and forgiveness upon us all. My brothers and sisters in Islam, what I wanted to share with you on this last day of the light upon light events is concerning the topic of death and how it was mentioned in the Quran by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I know sometimes that the topic of death could create panic and anxiety and worry for some. But I say to you that, Wallahu alam, anxiety and fear comes from the unknown. When you don't know something, you begin to fear it. And when that matter is clarified to you and you receive knowledge about this matter, it eases that anxiety. And I hope that with sharing this topic from the Qur'an, it creates that ease so that you know what you are looking forward to. Because death is a reality and this is a matter that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written upon everyone. Allah azza wa jalla says, أَفَإِمِّتَّ فَهُمُ الْخَالِدُونَ Allah azza wa jalla says to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you tasted death, do you think others are going to live forever? meaning everyone will die. Those that are most beloved to Allah would taste death. And as a result, everyone else on earth and every living creature will taste death. Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ Every nafs, every person shall taste death. And that means that the soul never dies. It only tastes death. It tastes it only as it's coming out of the body. What dies is the body. That's what decomposes and that's what's put into the earth. But the soul itself only tastes death. And you've all heard this ayah, Did you have a question? What is the implication of the word What is the implication of the word that each and every soul shall taste death? Allah did not say every soul will die. He said every soul shall taste death. You know when you taste something, it can either taste sweet or bitter and sour. And when people experience death, some will have a pleasurable experience, a sweet taste to it. And others will have a miserable experience and it will be bitter and sour for them. And you choose this for yourself. My brothers and sisters in Islam, in the final moments of life, when the soul is finally coming out of a person's body, it is at that very moment that you will realize nothing in this world is of any value and worth to you. At that moment when the soul is coming out, what does your wealth mean to you? Nothing. Your cars, your businesses, your friends, your family, all of these matters will have no value and no worth. In the final moments of life, you will realize that the only thing that has value and worth are your righteous actions and your good deeds, your salat and your Quran and your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I tell you something, you better learn this lesson right now. Because if you choose not to learn it now, Wallahi, before you leave this worldly life, 
you will learn this lesson that everything on earth has no value and no worth. The only thing that has value and worth are your righteous deeds in this relationship that you had with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you choose to learn this lesson now and work towards valuing what has value, then alhamdulillah. And if you choose to neglect and ignore this fact, just before you leave, you will realize what I had said and you will say that was right, but it is too late by then. My brothers and sisters in Islam, this is why the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructed us to remember death often. He said, Make mention of death and make mention of it in abundance. And he called it the destroyer of pleasures because that's the reality of death. It destroys the pleasures of this worldly life. And every single day we see an example of this. This worldly life is a fake enjoyment. Every pleasure you engage in becomes destroyed and you see it in this life how fake it is. I'll give you an example. Allah Azza wa Jal, when he described this worldly life, he said, وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ You all know this part of the ayah. That this worldly life is nothing but a deceptive enjoyment. It's a fake, false enjoyment. And you see this every single day. The food's in front of you. You enjoy the meal. Hours later it comes out. What a fake enjoyment. You drink the best of drinks. Then it comes out a few hours later. What a fake enjoyment. You sit with your friends and with your family, you chat, you laugh, you have the best times. All of a sudden you receive a call. Our friend has passed away. All of a sudden. No warning, no nothing. He's gone. What a fake enjoyment. Just yesterday we've enjoyed years and years together. And all of a sudden, I don't enjoy his company anymore. You wear the best of clothing. You save and you save your wealth to buy your favorite brand and your favorite sportswear. Then finally you purchase it. And a few months later, it wears and it tears away and you throw it in the bin. What a fake enjoyment. The very same things that we enjoy on earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them the thing that we see the fakeness of this worldly life within. And so we're supposed to awaken to this reality. And the more you know that this worldly life is a fake enjoyment, and that one day you will also be cut off from these worldly pleasures, there will come a day in which you will no longer eat, you will no longer drink, you will no longer be clothing yourself and dressing yourself. You will no longer be meeting with friends and going with this person and that person. You will no longer be taking this phone out to check your social media and go through reel after reel. You will no longer be doing this. A day will come. And this is why the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described death as the destroyer of pleasures. These are the things that you are pleased with, you enjoy. Death will come and will destroy them all at once. You won't enjoy any of them anymore. You're only there with your deeds going towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the more you remember death and the reality of this worldly life, what it's supposed to create is a sense of urgency within us to repent and to seek forgiveness from Allah azza wa jal. This is the purpose of remembering death because the one who's alert and aware of this reality he rushes to at tawbah wal istighfar and he will also be content with what he has. If a person has forgotten the topic of death, he will never be satisfied and content with what he has. But if a person is always remembering the topic of death and always aware of it, it will make him content with what he has. Because he'll say, 
I just need what I need until the last day, and then afterwards I'm going somewhere else. And it also softens the heart. And we need this in a day, of, in a day and age where the hearts have become tough and rigid because of the fitan and the corruption and the injustice that is around us. My brothers and sisters in Islam, indeed death soften the hearts. And it is, it is a reason for why Allah Azza wa Jal might forgive your sins by the mere fact of remembering it and remembering it. Jabir radiallahu anhu narrates that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Marra rajulun bi jumjumah. A man walked by a skull. There was a skull on the earth. So perhaps he was close to a graveyard, a cemetery. He passed by a skull and he remembered death. So he said, Allahumma ana ana wa anta anta. Ana al-awwadu bil-dhunub wa anta al-awwadu bil-maghfira. He said, oh Allah, I am who I am. The weak, sinful, heedless human being. And you are who you are. The Lord, the Almighty, at-tawwab rahim I am the one who frequently goes back to sinning. And you're the one who frequently forgives and accepts the repentance of the slaves. And he fell into a sajda. Then he heard a voice, a voice of an angel calling him. The angel said, raise your head, for indeed Allah is who he is. The all forgiving, the all merciful. And you are who you are. The sinner, the one who chose to acknowledge his state of sin and heedlessness. Allah has forgiven you. And Allah Azza wa Jal forgave him. And the scholars have mentioned that just by passing the cemetery and remembering death could be a reason for why Allah Azza wa Jal bestows his favor and mercy and forgiveness upon a person. My brothers and sisters in Islam, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us the five stages of how the soul is extracted and removed from the body. And it happens over five stages. These stages could happen in less than one second. They could happen in one minute. They could happen over a few days, over a few weeks, over a few months. Everyone is different. But every person that dies, his soul goes through five stages. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and the first stage, the first stage is the day of your death. Allah Azza wa Jal records this stage in Surah Al-Baqarah when he said, وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا تُرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ ثُمَّ تُوَفَّى كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَّا كَسَبَتْ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ Allah Azza wa Jal, he said, Fee the day in which you will return to your Lord. And the first stage is the day in which you will return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a day and a time, and it is very exact and specific, and a location as well. When your day of death arrives, that information, the information of the fact that you will be dying today, will be handed over to the angels that are in the company of Allah Azza wa Jal in the heavens. And they will begin their descent going to that person. They will have with them shrouds, from the shrouds of the paradise and the scent of musk, that's for the believer. And farther than the believer, shrouds from the fire will be prepared so that the soul, when it's extracted, it's wrapped up with the shroud. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ بِأَيِّ أَرْضٍ تَمُوتٍ No one knows where he will die. That ain't that Information is given to the angels. They know exactly where they're going to meet you. You might not be in that location yet. So let's say it is the day of your death. And the angels have been told to take your soul in a specific location. You're not there yet. They go down to that location. They don't come to where you are and follow you. They go to that location. There's no such thing as he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
That's something that is common on the tongues of people and it goes against the belief of the Muslim. Never, ever, ever say, upon receiving the news of the death or of a, de of a person that has died, he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. Never say that. Because the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if Allah decreed that he take the soul of a person, جَعَلَ لَهُ حَاجَةً When Allah decrees to take the soul of this person, at that exact location, Allah will make for this person a reason to end up being there. And as a result, you will travel to your final destination. You will go to it by your feet. And there is something beautiful in the Quran that describes our fear of death and how death approaches. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Qul inna al-mawt al-ladhi tafirun minhu fa innahu mulaqikum." Tell them, make an announcement to people and tell them, you see death, the one that you run away from, it will meet you. But you see the beauty in the language? Tafiruna minhu, to flee from something, is to have the danger behind your back and to run away from it. Allah Azza wa Jal says, this death that you're running away from, فَإِنَّهُ مُلَاقِيكُمْ it will meet you. And the word mulaqa is to see something in front of your face. So you're running away from it, but you're actually running towards it. You think it's behind you, but it's actually ahead of you. That's the first stage. The day of your death is handed over to the angels. The second stage is the stage in which the soul is collected from the body. So now the angels dive deep into the body and begin to collect the soul from the feet. And they bring it up all the way to the ankles and all the way to the hip and to the abdominal area. And they continue to pull it out until it reaches this area here, the chest. And of course, Malak al Maut doesn't work alone. He has angels with him. Allah Azza wa Jalla he says, "Hatta idha jaa ahadakum al mawtu tawaffatu rusuluna." That whenever a person is about to die, our angels are sent to him, and they extract the soul. So he has aiders, helpers, and supporters. Malak al mawt he has. They will extract the soul until it reaches this area. Malak al mawt's job is the final job, just to pluck the soul as it's at the end. The end stage. So that's the second stage. The soul is extracted from the body. That's when the feet go numb and cold. That's when a person's knees become numb and cold. That's when a person's legs, now he has lost control and movement in them as the soul is coming out. The third stage that Allah mentions in the Quran is the stage in which the soul has now reached to the collarbone, which is this area. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Kalla idha balagat al-taraqi." Allah Azza wa Jalla speaks about the stage in which the soul has reached al-taraqi, the collarbone. At that very moment, Allah Azza wa Jalla says. وَقِيلَ مَنْ رَاقَ Now the person is dying and the family is standing around him. Allah Azza wa Jal now tells us how the family would react. It's like the camera now has panned and it's moved towards the family so you can see their reaction in this third stage of death. The family would begin to scream out, مَنْ رَاقَ where is the Raqi? Where is the doctor? Where is the nurse? Who can come and aid him and help him? Hurry up. We don't have time. We're losing time. Allah Azza wa Jal says, The person that's laying there about to die, he now is certain that he is departing this worldly life. In the third stage, is when the dying person is certain that he is dying. 
Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, وَالْتَفَّتِ السَّاقُ بِالسَّاقُ And now the shin is folded over the other shin. What does that mean? Like this. If you stand and I put this foot over this foot, this here is called وَالْتَفَّتِ السَّاقُ بِالسَّاقُ But I ask you a question. If a person is there dying, does anyone do this? Do we grab his foot and fold it over the other? So what is Allah saying? That the foot, the shin has been folded over the other. What it means is this. When I stand like this, can I walk forward? It's impossible, you can't walk. What that means is that the third stage in which the soul comes out, you can no longer move forward in your relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal. If you now wanted to pray, it's too late. If you now want to adhere to the commandments of Allah, it's too late. If you now decided to wear al-hijab, it's too late. If you now decided to keep away from a lifestyle of heedlessness and sin and rebellion, it is too late. If you now decide to obey and respect your parents and stop causing harm and oppression to others, it is too late. Now you will be carried to your Lord because you can't, you're immobile now. From now on, the angels are going to take over. You don't have no control over your life from that point onwards. Allahu Akbar. This is why death was described in the Quran as a calamity. You know, there are many calamities in life. Financial calamities, uh, relationship calamities, so many. But the only calamity that Allah explicitly mentions in the Quran is death. He said, فَأَصَابَتْكُمْ مُصِيبَةُ الْمَوْتِ The calamity of death strikes you. And I think to myself, why is death a calamity for the person that is dying? I can understand how it's a calamity for those around the dying person. They're losing a loved one. They'll go through a difficult time. They'll grieve. They have to bury him. But the dying person himself, why is death a calamity for him? He's departing. He's going. The pains are soon going to end. It's because the dying person, once his soul is out, the record of doing good deeds has been closed. And that is the calamity. Now, if you wanted to say Astaghfirullah, you cannot. Imagine. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا مَاتَ ابْنُ آدَمَ انْقَطَعَ عَمَلُهُ When the son of Adam dies, his record of good deeds has come to an end. And it continues some hasanat if he's established some goodness for himself before his death. But for the vast majority, if you don't have some good deeds left on earth, that will be a flowing river of hasanat into your grief. You never established something beneficial for the people. Then your record has ended. I don't know. I don't know what the feeling of a person in his grief that can no longer say astaghfirullah. I don't know what his feeling is. I don't know how the feeling is for a person in his grief who can no longer make a sajda. My brothers and sisters in Islam, every single person in his grief at this very moment, if he was given the chance to come back to this life, wallahi, his only reason to come back would be to worship Allah. Nothing else. These are not my words. These are the words of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, Hatta idha jaa ahadahum al qala rabbi rji'oon. When death presents to a person this in the third stage, he says, My Lord, return me. The boy. He doesn't say, Lord, return me. I need to build my house. I had a bill to pay. I had some studies to finish. He says, صالحاً, In the hope that I may do some righteous deeds. 
Don't be fooled, my brothers and sisters in Islam. This world, the life never ends. Some people have in the back of their mind that when I finish my studies, I'll get serious. When I get married, inshallah, that's when I'll commit to the Islamic lifestyle. When this happens and that happens, then inshallah, I will reform. I tell you a fact about death. I'll give you my definition about death. Type that in your phone so that you don't forget it. Death. It is going to come way before you expect. Much, much, much before you expect. That's a simple definition of death. It comes way before you expect it. Every single person in his grief has unfinished worldly business. There is no grief on earth that if you had the chance to speak to the person in there, he'll say, brother, alhamdulillah, I finished all my worldly duties and I was ready to leave. No one. Someone will be in there, I, I was on my way to, to work, an accident. Someone else, I wanted to witness my son's uh, marriage, but I couldn't do it. Everyone will have something he still wanted to do, but death stopped his worldly dreams and hopes. Be careful. Be careful. That's the worldly life. That's how it is. So that's the third stage the soul has reached here. The fourth stage, Allah Azza wa Jal says about it, فَلَوْلَا إِذَا بَلَغَتِ الْحُلْقُومِ Now the soul reaches the throat area. This is al-hulqum. It's gone up from the collarbone to the throat. At that moment, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَأَنْتُمْ حِينَ إِذٍ تَنْظُرُونَ Now the family and the friends and everyone that's around him can just tanvurun. They're just looking at him. Allah says, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْكُمْ وَلَكِنْ لَا تُبْصِرُونَ And we are closer to him than you, but you cannot see. Meaning, Allah's angels are closer to him than you. He sees the angels of Allah. The person at that stage could possibly, if he's a believer, return the salam to the angels. Okay, because he sees the, the angels at that time. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, فَلَوْلَا إِن كُنْتُمْ غَيْرَ مَدِينِينَ تَرْجِعُونَهَا إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ then Allah Azza wa Jal gives a challenge to mankind. People that are atheists, people that deny resurrection and the afterlife, Allah has given them a little quick challenge at this moment. Allah says, if you actually believe, if you're certain of the fact that you will not be resurrected and questioned and held to account for your life, then Allah has a challenge for you. Allah says, Tarji'unaha. Try to return this soul back into this dying person's body. Go on. Push your soul back in. If indeed you are truthful, that there is no afterlife and there's no accountability. Up until this day, the challenge is open to every atheist. If you're not, and you know, with their millions and billions, with all their information and technology and research, and they are trying to find ways on how to bring someone back to life. And they're investing in technology in where the body could be preserved so that hopefully later in many years, there could be some sort of way into putting a soul and life back into that body. Ma'ad Allah! But if you cannot return the soul back into this person's body, then who gives you the, uh, who gives you the approval to speak about how matters run in this world, the life. If you couldn't do that, then humble yourself and accept the truth from your Lord. He's the one who caused your life. He's the one who's causing your death now and you can see it. Therefore, he's the only one who's able to return you back to this world, the life. And finally, and this is the fifth and last stage, and this is Malak al mouts job. He comes and now his job is to just pluck the soul. If it was a believing soul, it'll feel as though water is pouring out from a bottle. 
goes easy, gentle upon the believer. And if it's a disbelieving soul, then it will be ripped out of the body just like thorns are ripped out of wool. And that is because a disbelieving soul will see their destination, a horrible destination, the destination of the hellfire. So the soul doesn't want to go to that. It disperses again into the body. It's ripped out. As for the believer, he sees his destination. He sees the paradise and the mercy of Allah. So why would he want to stay in this entrapment, in this cage, in this prison, in this worldly life? So it flows and it comes out easily. And finally, at that moment, Malak al Maut says a few words. These few words, he says, would be a summary of your life. If it's a believing soul, he will say, Ya ayyatuha nafsu tayyibah. He will say, O oh, pure, beautiful soul, come out. Come out to a pleasure and a forgiveness of your Lord and to a Lord that is not displeased and angry with you. Allahu Akbar. And if it's a disbelieving soul, O oh, filthy, dirty soul, Come out to an anger and a displeasure of your Lord. You see that? What Malak al Maut says is a summary of your life. And so what that teaches us, if you want to hear, O oh pure, good soul, then you already know what your mission and purpose on life is. Work towards a pure soul. Work towards a good soul. Purify the soul. Reading the Quran purifies the soul. Every prayer purifies the soul. Every good deed purifies the soul. A good word you speak purifies your soul, prepares you for the meeting with Allah. And if you are preparing to meet Allah, then Allah would love to meet you. We ask Allah to make us from those who love to meet Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to bestow His ultimate mercy and forgiveness upon us all. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept from us all. Wallahu a'lam. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.